Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here to meet you. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Pardon? Yes, no? I'll, I'll become volume oriented. How many of you have studied polarity therapy? How many of you have practiced polarity therapy? Good. How many of you have been polarity therapy clients? Good. How many have never heard of polarity therapy? <laughs> Let me just give you a little bit by way of background, and then a lot of bit by way of what polarity therapy, from my view, is about. My background is in engineering, chiropractic, and naturopathic medicine in Oregon, where I practice and live currently in Ashland, Oregon. You know, And as an engineer, I was involved in diagnostic imaging system development back in the early 70s. And it became clear to me as I was involved in some very interesting work that medicine had to begin to look at the body as an electromagnetic system at least. I'm going to skip a lot of preliminary stuff. This five days. So I began to investigate how you do this. What does the body look like as an electromagnetic system? In my pursuits, I met Dr. Stone and Pierre Panassier and Stanton and studied with both of them. Dr. Randolph Stone developed this model and process that he called polarity therapy. This was back in 71, 72, something like that. I can barely spell my name. At that time of my life. And here I am studying with Dr. Stone, something he called polarity therapy. And I'm an engineer. I had no intent to do anything with it. I was just drawn to this information. And when I studied with Pierre Panassier, it was like coming home. My hands somehow felt back attached to my body, and I knew what to do. So Dr. Stone spent four days in each seminar being exasperated. <laughs> His standard response to any question was, it's in the book. If you've read this book, you know, that can be an obscure statement. <laughs> so that didn't help us a lot. And then he wasn't terribly interested. Terribly interested in techniques. So, in each four day seminar, he taught us the same two techniques. <laughs> One was holding on to the inside of the ankle. So called naked clinger, plus the health of You know that one? Can you do a study? The other was sort of a modified North Pole stretch. All I remember was you put your fire fingers right in the suboccipital triangle. The other finger sort of cradled the occiput. Your thumbs end up wherever they end up. And your Index fingers also end up wherever they end up, and you hope. <laughs> that was it. That was polarity therapy technique. All he taught. And slowly, slowly, we started to catch on what he was really teaching. He had an essence that he understood. And the way he practiced had nothing to do with techniques or the books, for that matter. So of course you'd say, if you want to know the answer to some particular issue, check out the books. But if you want to understand the essence of this, just listen. And then when he saw our eyes glaze over, he would just say, if I could just take my head off and put it on yours. <laughs> and we should say, I wish you could. <laughs> so it was like a, a spiritual discourse for us at that time. It was new information unprecedented for all of us taking this work from many walks coming in. And slowly several of us just continued to study his work. And we eventually started APSA, American Blood Therapy Association. And then out of the 
work we had done, we created the standards for practice and that set up curricula throughout the world now. And the deeper I study Dr. Stone and a wider view of energy medicine, which is now my whole primary focus in research and other avenues that I put my attention in, I begin to get a sense of what Dr. Stone was talking about. Someday I'll understand what he meant. But I begin to get a sense. He had a wide view, a wide understanding of human experiences. He had a view from a cosmologic perspective. He studied the mystics deeply and cited them often. And even in his books, he alludes overtly and covertly to their teachings or their writings. He also studied, to his capacity, physics, chemistry, biology. He had degrees in osteopathy what was called an NP or an OP degree, an other physician's degree, which would be sort of like a nature path now, and, or chiropractor. He had a wide background in formal education. His library was about 2,500 books, all well read. And I was eventually, after his death and Pierre Panettiere's death, given several boxes filled with all of his copies, actually, of all of his original works. This man was prolific, incredibly prolific. He never stopped researching. He never stopped developing the model. And he never stopped working deeply inside himself at the most subtle levels. And that's what he brought out as an essence. So his workshops or seminars or we call them experiences, whatever you wish to call them, were never the same. They couldn't be. He would just tap into something else, feel where we were, and go with that. So it wasn't much about teaching polarity therapy as a system for healing as a technique. I need to impress that strongly on you. And the reason I need to impress that strongly on you is most of you are now in class finishing class, that's my understanding, that will be taking this five-day course. And you have been saturated with technique. The standards are about learning basics. You're not saturated with technique? <laughs> Good. <laughs> Most students are saturated with technique. Learn is not about that. <coughs> it's a relationship. A relationship between you and another person. And there's a dynamism in that relationship. That relationship means a lot and expresses a lot. And there's an exchange that happens in any dynamic relationship. You can say energetically, but what does that mean? I want to ask you, what is energy? You tell me. Life. Life? The description of energy. The specific form of energy. <coughs> Movement. Yes. <coughs> Life, work, parts of energy, expressions of energy, energy in its essence is motion. Motion. If it moves, you can call it energy. And it takes on many shapes, many forms, as many as we have as experiences in creation is energy. Now we know also that energy contains in it a pattern. Here we talk about frequencies. We measure, say, electromagnetic energies, or acoustic energy, or thermal energy, or any other form you care to look at. You can distill the chemistry, you can distill the structures to frequencies. When you're in the land of frequency in physics, you're also in the land of form. Where there's frequency, there is form. Where there's form, there is frequency. They are completely interchangeable. Let's go deeper. If we can distill what we see and what we perceive it as form into frequencies, what's a frequency? Just ask simple questions. What's a frequency? Change. Signature. It's got a quality that's unique to whatever it's seen.
seemingly emanating and coming back into from any form of the transceiver. It transmits and receives information. Right? It is chi. But what generates the frequency? Take a simple view of source, still pond. Okay, we have a substrate. We have this potential for something to happen. And now I take a pebble, dump it into the pond. What happens? We get these ripples that go out concentrically <coughs> from that pebble. You have an event that was created that created a source for that information to go out as frequency those ripples are, okay, on a substrate that in this case is water. Now, suppose I take a second pebble. And right after I toss the first one in, I toss the second one in. Now what happens? Two ways. I get two of them. Two ripples going out. But those ripples, they cross each other. So what's that called? An interference pattern. Where they meet peak to peak, they get bigger. Where they meet trough to trough, they get lower. Where they meet peak to trough, they cancel each other out and all the things in between. Now, suppose you could squeeze that pond all at once. And those two ripples hit each other. We now have what we call a hologram. Okay. And you can play back the original event just by tracking back the interference pattern to those original two events. We'll take a substrate for our experience of physical domain life. In physics, that substrate, the most infinitesimal form of matter, is called what? Quark. Quark. No. Quarks are on top of these things. Atoms. No. No. Ether. Okay. Not the Michelson Morley ether that they thought was a kind of a wind, but it's called ether. The most infinitesimal form in physics is now called ether. Okay, they catch you on. <clears throat> ether is the most irreducible form of matter. I look at it as an ether sea, sort of like the pond of the initial example. Now we have this substrate, this background of ether. Now, how do you ripple the ocean? It's a spheric ocean. You put events in it. We talk about how those events come in and move. But an event goes into this ether sea and it sends out ripples. And another event happens, and another event, and another. And they seem to be separate, and we call that time. And they move away from the source, we call that space. It's a simple view. This is a very short. Each of these ideas has trains. Mm -hmm. I gotta say <laughs> I do one of these, I'm doing this. Okay. Now I gotta bring myself back to the platform. So events occur in this ether sea. Ripples are created point sources of information. Okay. When it's visible light, we call a point source as what? A laser. You heard of lasers? Mm -hmm. L-A-S-E-R. You know what that stands for? Light amplification simulated emission of radiation. Mm -hmm. All it is. Okay. It's coherent light. All the waves travel out together. Very powerful. You heard of a maser? It's microwave amplification of stimulated emission of radiation. Okay. The physical plane has an electromagnetic spectrum. The widest domain of that electromagnetic spectrum is the microwave range. This 17 octaves wide. It turns out that all biologic systems communicate primarily in that arena. In fact, if you look at any 
biologic system in its form. It is a waveguide, a series of complex waveguides that transmits and receives information in the microwave range. It's exquisite research that's going on today in peer-reviewed journal literature. This is not just Larry Therapy. This is hard science. This is what people are realizing today. When you learn the polarity model, the polarity principles, and you apply it therapeutically as polarity therapy, I don't know if you're aware of it, but you're dealing in mainstream understanding of science emergent today. This is the language, the model, the concepts that are emerging today. It's the Orient. Now, let's look at the body. <laughs> We're going to look at a basic model now. We're going to create the body. When Dr. Stone described the body, he took a leap conventionally. He said the body, in fact, is an etheric form at one level, the etheric energy body. He began to describe it in terms that most folks in, the, in this culture have never heard of, haven't studied much. He used terms like chakras, which is a Sanskrit word meaning world, spin. He acknowledged from the Ayurvedic principles and principles that have been handed down since time to appreciate how these chakras, how these centers, how these worlds organize energy, move energy in the body and create form. They do more than that. Talked about energy coming into the physical form. We won't even deal with that tonight. We will proceed. And those two currents come into physical form in a particular form, a particular way, double spiral double helix, a common print found throughout the body. Genetic material and windings and fibers of various forms, various kinds, that construct the physical body, what I call the watery form. Now, each chakra holds a characteristic energy. There is a step down of energy that occurs through what becomes, in the human body, the center of the head. It's called the eye focus, the sister cell, the open sesame of the body. It's called this eye center. And then energy steps down from the eye center and forms a step-down concentration. It is now holding energy at a step-down level, its own set of frequencies, named ether. It has its set of characteristics. And that steps down further into an element that holds that energy. We call it air. Right at the center of the heart. The center of the spine, actually, the mid-thoracic spine behind the heart. That energy steps down further into the middle of the low back. In L2-3, right behind the belly button, called fire. That energy steps down further again into an area right at the lumbosacral junction, in the middle of the pelvis, the upper pelvic brain, called water. And the final energy in this step down progression is right at the sacral coccygeal junction, called the 
rectal cancer also. Earth. Now this is the beginning formation embryologically. This is all occurring in an area that will become in the embryo eventually the central canal of the spinal cord. You know, from here, a number of amazing things start to happen. These are all point sources of information. They all carry coherent radiation at that level, at that chakra. Keep in mind, major. When Dr. Stone <coughs> described an etheric energy body, he talked about Patterns that occur from these centers, from these chakras. And you, most, you all know these, right? Anybody know? Several things happen from here. First of all, well, one of the things is from the fire center, the spiral goes out and back. And from the front, it's spinning according to the right-hand rule. Put your thumb in your bow button, spin it, and that's the direction the currents go. If you do the same thing from the back between L2 and 3, it's going this way, and then back. Always reminds me of a top. So here's currents balancing themselves front and back. Right? If you only had one spinning this way, you'd fall over. And if you're drunk, you're missing one, you fall over. <laughs> <laughs> one gets shorter. These are real things. We're creating technology to image this stuff. It's real stuff. This is not a mental construct. You can train yourself to see them, to feel them, to taste them, to hear them. As energy comes down through here, it spirals back up. <laughs> spirals back up that way. And this way. Goes back into the center of the head. It's called feedback. These all have specific purposes that we're beginning to appreciate. So now you have these two currents spinning around like this. What if just one was cut off? All you do. <laughs> you ever felt dizzy? <laughs> Thank you. Now, have you ever seen these supernovas? They spin and they send off these shoots of fire. Each of these chakras is like a supernova. <coughs> some very intricate things when they start going out. These currents start to go out, back, back, out, back, back. And you get this constant left-right response, back and forth, feeding back left and right information. As you know, on the right side they're going in front, on the left, this way, on the left side they're coming back. Kind of like doing this. <laughs> and you have these long currents moving energy on the right and the left. One shuts down. get in balance. You can begin to see that inside this, inherent in this, are lines of force, <coughs> are relationships of energies that create form that keep the structure intact. The interlaced triangles, the five-pointed star patterns, the fetal position of the evolutionary pattern, the bow position of the evolutionary pattern, the of the inherent in all of this. You start from this pattern, and you project the whole movement of energy into the body, and then it reflects back the feedback. It's this constant interplay of energies that sustain and support and create what we call an etheric energy body. Now, what would you call that when you look at all those things together? What does it look like to you? Chaos. Who? Chaos. Chaos? Yeah. Interference. I call it a mess. 
It is an interference pattern. It's precisely an interference pattern. But watch what happens. You have a point source of information generating these fields, these lines of movement. You have this interference pattern that creates what we'll call now a hologram in space. You know in a hologram, you know, you create the hologram, it's a laser beam, split it, shoot one at an object, shoot other at a plate. You've got a bullseye pattern, which is your reference beam. You've got all this diffraction of light off the object. You superimpose these two. You try to look at it with a light like that, it's not real successful. You take a laser light, shoot it, and now you project the image of the object in space. Called a virtual image. You took a smoke screen and you smoked the other side of the air. We have this projection of illusion, but there's also a real image. We'll go to that in a so here we have this what we'll call illusion in space, created by point sources of information, sending energy out and interfering with each other, creating these interference patterns with real specific frequencies that appears to be solid. Appears to take on shape. How is it that it can appear to be real? Tell me. How can it appear to be real? How can the senses appear to be so real? How did we play back the whole thing? What did we use to play back the whole thing? Coherent radiation, laser light. When we perceive this experience, projected from these senses, and this body at this level projected from these senses, we are looking at it through what I call point source lenses. Our attention bounces up and down through these. As we perceive it, we perceive through different criteria that we call senses. Each sense sends out a reference beam even known current physiology. You must be aware of this research. But each sense sends out a reference beam as coherent radiation from the ear, from the eyes, any sense you care to look at. Information is then taken back on that reference beam, and we now perceive what we're looking at as tangible. And the senses are taken in as being real. And so we look at something, we touch it, we feel it, we smell it, we hear it, and we call it real. See this believing all of that. It has its limits. So what is kind of we're in this we're in this together. So in this pattern, we have this projection of energies, creating this interference pattern. We call it a spheric form. It is the template out of which other aspects of the body are created. And we perceive them as apparently real. Let's get this closer I can get. We call it an illusion. Now what happens? What I want to get to is down to the cellular level, and even smaller than that. I want you to see how this plays itself out. And then we're going to create polarity therapy. Each of these chakras does other things other than send energy around. It shunts energy to another subset of chakras, centers. There's about a hundred of them. <coughs> Here we have what we call an etheric body. There's a, sh a shunting of these to other centers throughout the body. They then send out lines, send out information in three particular directions. And I call this an airy body. It's more what I call radiosonic, acoustic form. 
said Jenny's working some of that. Yeah. I took fluid media and put it on frequency generators, sonic, subsonic, supersonic, mainly sonic range. Created literally every form we have in the body with different fluid media. And that's going on still. And in some cases, quite sophisticated. Each of those chakras sends energy to another subset of chakras. There are about a thousand of them. I call this the fiery body. Also called the microducular system, or the acupuncture system of traditional Chinese medicine. It has its orthogonal, three directional patterns. <laughs> These particular channels, microducts or microductules, channel inside the networking systems of the body, so the blood, lymph, and nervous system tissue. And they carry ionic information. This carries what I'll call subatomic information. This carries etheric information. That's what happens. We've got two more to go. <laughs> this sends information to another subset of chakras. About a hundred trillion, ten to the fourteenth. What do you think I call this one? The watery body. This is the metabolic form. It has three primary pathways of movement. Blood, lymph, and CSF, cerebrospinal fluid. Moving through its channeling networking system. It's in the realm of molecules, what we call biochemistry, primarily. This then shunts energy to something I don't know. Wow. Mm -hmm. I call this an earthy body, otherwise known as a genetic body. We're now at the cellular level, at the gene level. The gene is a chakra. It carries information. In the cell, we now have a whole other microcosm of the whole system. Right? There's families that live in these cells in our bodies. You know the whole notion of pleomorphism, polymorphism. Right? So, Shump, Enderlein, uh, Livingston, she worked with Tripp, I studied with Tripp, so I got into this stuff. Now, uh, Gaston makes sense. And if you've read their works, in a consistent history of developing this this field. In the cell, you have what they call organelles. You ever studied cell biology, cell biology, cell physiology? In the cell, there's a representation of every function that the body has. The endocrine system, the muscular system, the skeletal system, the nervous system. Within those organelle structures, there is also additional life transmitted through the genetic material. That life are microbes, there's a set of them, families, that exist symbiotically together with the other structures within the cell. Without them, life doesn't exist in the human body. As the pH changes of the cell and the electric potential of the cell shifts, <coughs> and the field pattern changes around the cell, these little structures, these microbes, create another life. They have their life cycle. It's named polymorphism or pleomorphism, meaning many stages of structure, many structural changes. <coughs> the first form that's created out of these, when the pH starts to shift, is viral. The second form is bacteria. The third form is predominantly fungal. The fourth form is cancerous. It's inherent in the body. <laughs> How do we create all of this? How does it change? Why does it look the way it looks? Why do we feel the way we do it? Why do we walk around the way we do it? Perhaps it's not to share something. You're here with Paracelsus. Alchemist in the 16th century. Went to visit his home outside of Zurich. <laughs> 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 I had to eat 
Paracelsus used to call aspects of the body mental tumors. You ever mental tumors? You ever seen a mental tumor? These things are attached to the field. A lot of them look pedunculated, like sacks, like big water balloons. And we fill these things with all this stuff we don't want to deal with or understand. We want to disown and dissociate from them, deny them. However, we need to go through our experiences. And most of them stuck underneath the armpit. Make it more elaborate. We walk around. We begin to perceive the field. It's phenomenal. What's there that most folks don't have an understanding or clue about, but they know it someplace in themselves? You ever felt dense or heavy okay. or burdened or like something is on you and you just can't get it off? Those are real. <laughs> get our attention. Like that. <coughs> so let's not go further. Now we add to this, we build on this. We get to learn this. We're going to add to this a thought. Keep in mind. When we're in the domain of mind, we're in the domain of form as we know it. Mind requires form to function. So mind takes on a shape. Dr. Stone talked about cosmology, causal level, astral level, physical level, as domains of mind. In the causal realm, he alludes to a, a causal body. Right? So, astral level, he talks about an astral body. Physical level, physical body. Mm -hmm. Form the mind takes on to function. Yet there's something that infuses the mind, that enlivens the mind, that must experience those aspects of creation and require some transducer to do that. Okay. The soul, the spirit, talks about it much of his literature. So the mind's pretty stupid. The mind's function is to secrete thoughts. Okay. I look at it as a dumb diving bell. The soul takes it on and goes into it to experience the realm of creation. It's no more in control of the soul, ultimately, than this shirt is in control of my arm. <laughs> Say, the shirt is moving my arm. We think that absurd. Okay. No different than acknowledging the relationship of what infuses the mind and the mind itself. The physical body is the form of the physical mind. At the causal level, he talks about superconsciousness. At the astral level, he talks about consciousness. That starts from here and goes up. We are unconscious or subconscious most of our existence. Most of it, <coughs> all of our existence. This is the form of the subconscious mind. If you want to know what a person's subconscious mind is about, it will show it to you. And it's a profound way to understand the subconscious mind through its form. And yet, it is simple and common. So, thoughts secrete in the mind. It's like <coughs> you know how a cathode ray tube works, a television set, you know, cathode and anode. Got these charged plates. And you heat up this cathode and it leads off electrons. That's what cathodes do in our years. And you have this anode that you put a charge on, like 100,000 volts or whatever. And now you generate this, this rapid movement of these electrons toward this charged plate called a plasma gas. And then you focus it. There's different ways to focus it. And then you put a raster on it. Spins it all over. You can get a, an image on a television screen, take a frost on the back, and then you can look at it. Well, that analogy works. 
to appreciate some aspects of how thoughts come into form. You know, we have this mind leading off thoughts. And in that domain, we don't carry much of a charge. They're just thoughts. We don't pay much attention to them. They're just thoughts. That may sound bizarre to us here. Thoughts have impact to us here. And those thoughts take on energy as they start descending toward the end or the physical plane of conclusion to what I call history. Things that are after the fact. The events are completed by the time they get here. So they move through the domain of emotion. They take on charges. They come into the body. Now we have this charged thought in coming into the system, through the parasympathetic system, into the, through, into the sympathetic system, through the, the, uh, through the spinal system, and into the body musculature. And then we act on that thought charged with some kind of desire or emotionality attached to it. When that thought comes in, like this focusing plate that comes into the body, now we have this charged distortion that has to somehow organize the body to do something to act on that thought. Watch what happens. It's just such a perfect circle. <laughs> That's right in the middle of the circle. That's the hub. You know, if you put a wheel with the hub right in the middle and you spin it, it's easy to spin. You make it reach well, it spins for a long time. You make the superconductor it spins well. It's easy. <laughs> so a thought comes in and it's neutral. Suppose we had a truth. Can you imagine a neutral thought? Can you imagine a neutral thought? <laughs> a thought comes in with a charge of some sort, some charge distribution. It's got a form. It comes into the body, kind of moves its axis off center, mm -hmm. and it's charged. So now, this wheel is not moving around there, it's moving around someplace out here. Eccentric. Have you ever ridden on a bicycle with an eccentric axis? Mm -hmm. Clowns do that, you don't move very fast. Mm -hmm. And as a result, the source of that thought, of that information, doesn't get everything back that it sent out. Something got held in the body. It was neutral. It created a shape that was not optimal, not ideal, to move into the body, move all the way through, move back to its source, and be complete. So there's some residual that's held in the body. And the way that thought's formed determines how it's distorted in the body, how it's held in the body. And we said it's a different pattern that exists emotionally, and with the passions and the virtues and all these things in polarity work. Yes, sir. Anybody <laughs> not? Yes. <coughs> we'll do more of that. So now this pattern is, is created in the form, and we have another thought over time, many. And progressively, depending on how we deal with them, that axis becomes progressively more and more eccentric. And it takes more and more energy to sustain life at this level. The body is functioning more and more inefficiently. Now, as we go through this week, we're going to talk a lot about this whole process and how to work with it, and what it means, what it looks like, what it feels like, how to access it. There's a lot to this. Yes. As the senses send out the reference beam mm -hmm. and receive back the information, does it, the analogy hold true for the thought? So when the thought first comes out, the reference beam? <coughs> Thought is moving into form. <clears throat> it already carries some distortion with it, some charge distribution around it. Because of it moving through the emotional field, is that what you're saying? Yes. But at the source, the source of the thought, is it acting as a reference beam at that point? Or no. It's just secreting thoughts. Just the best going on. So 
I'm going to say yes and no. From a higher perspective, yeah. yes. Because there's another track back. Right. But from this perspective, in the physical body, There's a basic notion in polarity theory. When a source sends out, it wants to have come back. Why? Because a source is whole. It's complete unto itself. So what it transmits, it wants to bring all the way back and receive. Is that basic model? Okay. That's the theme of all of this. The source is neutral. It's balanced. All charges exist simultaneously in the same space at the same time. When it transmits information, or sends out its information, or it's, it creates energy by movement, how does it do that? Well, inherent neutrality is a distribution of charges, positive and negative. The two forces are simultaneously generated, one positive, one negative. On that outgoing impulse, Two things happen. Energy is sent out and it splits. It becomes something. To be something, there's a polarity. Why a polarity? Because there's a difference between something and nothing. That's a polarity. So we, by convention, call one positive, one negative. This is just a slice. If you looked at it, you see it would look like a big donut. Or an apple with a small So that information goes out and it has to make a return circuit to be pulled back in by this drawing in current back to the source. Now keep in mind, the source is whole. It is complete. Whatever it sends out, it wants back. Now, you know what happens when that doesn't happen. You ever eaten a hamburger with Coke and French fries? Okay. Those things, <laughs> pardon? It's been years. <laughs> Good. You know people that do that? You work on clients that do that. You ever eaten too much cheese? Start there. <laughs> <laughs> right. All those foods have energies in nature. Nature is very jealous. What it sends out, it wants back. So you ingest the stuff. So you take it in in such a way that you don't allow everything you took in to go back out. Okay? It doesn't metabolize completely. You know, your gut, it doesn't break down completely. Hydrochloric acid is sufficient. The body is too oxygen. It's too oxygenated. It's too alkaline. Whole <clears throat> physiology of metabolism to look at. And so some stuff stays residually in the body, gets stored. Right? Nature's pulling that back all the time. When do you think it gets it? Well, if you clean up, you know, fasted, go through a cleansing process, purifying diet, that sort of thing. What are you doing? Give it back to nature, what it demands. Sources are very jealous. Whatever they send out, they want back. And they will get it back. Thank God. <clears throat> now, as energy is leaving its source and following this positive impulse out, it's eventually going to get to a point where it's farthest removed from its source, where that contracting energy or withdrawing energy starts to exert its primary pull and draws back. As the energy is going out, you're all well aware that the energy steps down. Ether, air, fire, water, earth. And as it is drawn back to its source, it steps up. Earth, water, fire, air, ether. Step down, step up. So the energy is moving away from its center. It's cascading. 
like droplets coming out of droplets coming out of droplets. This is highly significant in a lot of ways in terms of how process functions, how perception functions, how time and space function, how a body functions. Energy that's been contained there does what? Travels back. It's released. What happens when it's released? Automatically, what happens? It goes back to its source. Not by its own mode of energy, but by the sources drawing it back. How do we assist that process of allowing energy that's been held in the body? own bodies to go back to their source. Moving those and releasing. That's a term. It's really important. Supply energy. Supply energy. Conduct. Conduct. Actually, in many ways. And that's what I want to do next. We're going to derive polarity therapy. Okay? I have a question. In this two hour stint, are we taking breaks? This is an appropriate break point. Five to eight, I'd like to start up no later than five after.